Guys, it's finally bottling day. It's been forever, honestly. The fantastic thing about this type of project is you can leave it on the shelf for a really long time because basically what you're gonna do after you bottle it is leave it on the shelf for a really long time. In case this is the first video of ours that you're watching, we actually have done an entire series on this mead project. This is honey wine. And technically it's not mead for the purists out there. They're gonna call it melomel. It's actually a wine that is made with honey and fruit. This fruit we actually foraged last year and we kept it in our freezer so that we could work on these homebrew projects during the winter. And we finally got around to starting the mash and doing the initial ferment. And then of course we did a video on the secondary fermentation, which is what you're looking at right here. And now we're to the point where it's time to bottle it and maybe enjoy just a wee bit of it. Bottling for us this time around is gonna be a lot different. We actually did a round of mead uh, two years ago and it was actually a reaction to the abundance of fruit in our area and because we were living off grid, we had really no way to temperature control or keep food for long periods of time. So we asked ourselves, how can we preserve this? And I don't know about you guys, but we can only eat so much jam. So I looked into booze, right? Because alcohol is a great way to preserve things and we enjoy it and we have never found anybody who has turned us down who we've offered it to. So it's a great gift for neighbors and guests. This is the sole remaining bottle from that batch. Something I'm super curious about with this round of mead is has the flavor improved even more? The previous video that we did on this series, we actually tasted it when we put it into secondary. I pulled out just a tiny bit. It's good now, but I know it'll taste better later to see how much it had changed from the initial, what we call first fermentation. And it had changed a lot. Um, after the first fermentation, it feels, or it tastes like water, honey, and fruit. If your palate's good, you can actually taste all three. It's not a very delicate flavor. But after the secondary, uh, when we when we put it into uh, these carboys to sit on the rack for quite a while uh, I saved that just a little bit 
and the flavor had already melded. And I think that was probably around three months or so sitting in the secondary fermentation. We're at six months. That's how long this has been sitting total, including the primary fermentation and what we'll call secondary. The secondary is more, well, we've re-racked it once. And so the secondary in this case is more for clarification. The secondary ferment technically stopped when we re-racked it. So I guess this would be like third fermentation. It's the third time it's been moved and you'll see that the beverage is getting more and more clear. If you look back at some of our early videos on this, especially this apricot, it's extremely cloudy. It tastes fine, but I, the rumor is, and I'm not refined enough to know if this is true or not, that a lot of that pulp is actually pectin, and the pectin can kind of create a bitter flavor. And if you're wanting a smooth kind of, uh, not sweet, but smooth flavor, you've got to get rid of that pectin. We can use an enzyme that I think digests a lot of that pectin, which I Gosh, I can't remember if we did that or not. But anyway, if we did, good on us. I think we might have. And the goal is to get a very clear, or as clear as possible beverage. And that means that you've gotten rid of all the pulp and the solids, and uh, most importantly, that stinking pectin. If you look super close at the bottom of this carboy, there's probably a good half inch or five, five eighths of an inch of solids sitting there. That all has clarified all on its own over the past three months. If you look back at our previous videos, I think this one, the last time we clarified it, had probably maybe two inches. Or oh, I mean, it was a lot of pulp. I was really surprised how much pulp was in this apricot. We didn't blend it or anything. We basically just took the apricots, we threw them in a mash, and then we strained them out with a nylon bag. All that, we still had over two inches of pulp in here, and I guess that's just apricots for you. This remaining pulp down here, is probably a combination of yeast that is dead now. It's basically run out of sugar. The fermenting process, basically the yeast eats the sugar and for lack of a more sophisticated term, it poops alcohol, right? <laughs> so basically what we're left with is an alcoholic beverage. And if you watch some of the earlier videos, we kind of talk about yeast and sugar content and predicting the alcohol content and all that stuff. And that's basically what we're left with here. Hopefully all of our uh, mead today is gonna look super good like this. You can't quite see through here, but there's definitely more light coming through this beverage than I've seen before. In fact, you can see the straw in the beverage there, and that's progress. I don't think we could see that probably as recently as three months ago. Part of having a good homebrew experience I'm learning is having all the right tools. Having good carboys and airlocks is important. Just, you have, to, you have to find a way to make this stuff fit your life. But one thing that I lacked was what's called a racking cane. And that's what this is. A neighbor actually had one. He heard that we were making mead and he suggested that we borrow his. So we are. He made beer. And this racking cane is actually made for a much larger carboy like in the five gallon range. And that's why this is so large. It's meant to fit over the spout. And then I believe you just blow in this hole which pressurizes your carboy. And of course it expels the liquid. The nice thing is because it's so tall, it's very controllable. And unlike siphoning, which we did in our previous video, it's actually very hard to get started and it's very hard to stop. You don't really want to stop, especially when you get near the bottom and you're getting close to these solids. The racking cane, on the other hand, has a small stop on the bottom of it that holds the straw up off the bottom so you don't suck the undesirables out of the bottom of the container and effectively put them into your jars. When we first did this mead project two years ago, we were at the local brew shop and kind of discussing this with the guy that was there. And he said, hey, we got a bunch of free bottles from a local brewery. They're going to cans. They don't want them. Do you guys want them? And we thought, free bottles? That sounds awesome. So he gave us all these bottles. The problem is the label was included. And this is why a lot of home brewers don't fuss with these types of bottles. The labels are extremely difficult to remove. We didn't, when we gave these bottles away, we just said, that's not what's in there. That's actually mead. It's not whatever's on the label. But it got us through and it was very budget friendly. So if you're looking to do this type of thing on a budget, Look around, there's a lot of glass out there that's absolutely free and uh, people probably be more than happy to let you have it. Uh, we did buy a capper, which you use for these types of bottles. We bought the cap, 
blanks or whatever you want to call them and then there's a small handle device that you use to cap the bottles. The pro of this bottle is that it's dark colored and there's something to this, I'm not an expert on this, but I believe it limits the amount of UV light getting to the liquid, which will diminish the flavor, can affect the stability of it over time, i.e. it goes bad. We're gonna try something a little different this time, and here's hoping we don't have a problem. Because these brews are so pretty, I believe that part of the joy of home brewing isn't just drinking the liquid, but it's kind of having something around that you can enjoy, that you can talk about with others, and share and in that vein we decided to invest in these little uh, eight and a half ounce bottles and because it's something that we really take pride in we found someone who could engrave these with a laser engraver we just had to put our initials on them for a couple reasons one we're really proud of these products and we want to share them and we want people to know where they came from and two we hope to get our bottles back that seems to be a really common problem. So now that we have our initials on here, if we see one of these bottles in Goodwill, we're gonna start chasing people down and uh, you know beating them up or something. So kind of a fun little project. The other thing that was a problem with this bottle is that it's 16 ounces and it's just too much for this type of a beverage. Most people can't drink 16 ounces of this in one sitting. It's kind of a sipping wine. We wanted something a little smaller. So we looked for a, a eight and a half ounce bottle and these are more like a personal serving, something you could finish at dinner or maybe even share a glass with somebody else. In the home brewing uh, hobby niche, I think bottling is something that you really have to think long and hard about. You've done all this work to get your product, whatever it is, beer, wine, ales, ciders, whatever it is, and packaging it is something that you can have a lot of fun with. It doesn't have to just be a functional thing. It can be something that you can take pride in. We're gonna try these clear bottles. Um, we've had a couple people kind of give us warnings about that. We're worried that we're gonna lose the beverage. I think the back end of that is because it's a clear bottle and they're kind of enjoyable to look at, they're gonna get more attention and maybe this stuff won't stick around as long. When it's in these darker bottles, it's easy to confuse them for other, other things like beer and you're like, ah, I'm not really in the mood and so it ends up getting overlooked. Something that I feel like is probably not a bad idea to think ahead about, let's say you have a dinner party and you want to share some mead with a bunch of different people. You don't want to break open, say, six of these small bottles. It's not going to go well, and you're going to use up a bunch of your single serving bottles, when if you had a little bit bigger bottle, bingo, now you could share. So we actually have these 16 ounce flip top bottles that we've been using for fermented beverages, things like that. So I think for each um, fruit, I'm gonna just make one of these bottles. Uh, we'll see. And then I kind of asked around and said, hey, does anybody have any bottles they're not using that would work really good for mead? And I had people drop off bottles that were this size. This to me is a cider bottle. They're definitely larger and ciders come in larger quantities, but we do have them. I've uh, sanitized them. If we have to, we'll end up using them. But man, that's, that's something that, you know, you're probably gonna, you have to really open it a party because you're just not gonna drink it fast enough. Of course, with the flip top bottle, I suppose you could store it for a little while, but you're gonna have to drink a lot of mead to get rid of that. down toward the bottom. Looks like we might have enough in there for, let's see, probably at least one more of the small bottles. I uh, don't really have a good plan for this yet. So let's see, that's 72 ounces. And then what's that, 32? So that's about 104 ounces, 104. Well, it looks like by the math, we actually have enough for another large bottle. So I think we'll do that and we'll see if we can't finish out this jug. That'll kind of give me a barometer for what to do for these other batches. Oh, oh well. 
I might have mentioned, which wasn't obvious, that the challenge with this bottling is that you cannot, you cannot shake the carboy. If you shake it, that sediment will whip up so fast. If you sneeze, you're done. And I basically had a small problem with this thing wanting to whip around and all it did was stir up all that sediment. So basically, when it came time to bottling, we just lost all that mead, which really sucks. I mean, it's drinkable, but it's not something that you really want. And so I think we're done. So it looks like this bottle didn't get destroyed. Um, it still looks fairly clear. It's not perfect, but it's good enough. And it looks like we ended up only getting half that bottle even though the math said we should get more because it's all sitting there in the bottom. This is really the challenge with bottling. It's, it's an oddly simple looking process, but I think at the end of the day, this is really where you can lose a lot of the product that you've worked really hard to create. And if you do it well and, you, and you're patient and you take your time, you'll end up with lots and lots of good mead. And if you get too crazy or impatient, you'll just waste a bunch of it. This could take another three months to settle out and it's just not worth it. So I think this will be for drinking tonight. We have some guests coming over and I think it'll be fun to share. You know what, I probably better sample that really quick, make sure it's delicious. Oh, be doggone, you dirty dog. Wow, that is good. <laughs> no way. So the flavor's totally smoothed out. I remember tasting this, and I, I can't remember back when we did our secondary, which one was my favorite. This is gonna be really hard to trump. It's so smooth. I wish you guys could try this. I, I didn't expect this from the apricot. I don't know, I kinda had low expectations because of the amount of pulp and just the amount of solids and losing a lot in the fermentation process. And I thought, yeah, you know, if it turns out, it'll be great. Ooh, I'm gonna have a hard time, I think, keeping people's hands off of this. It's actually just a little tiny bit sweet, too. I'm not sure why. It makes me a little worried that if I'm not careful, we might get some fermentation in the bottles. Like maybe the yeast went dormant for some reason. It could just be perception because it's so smooth. I think when something's not smooth, it kind of gives it that flat or almost bitter palate. Mm. Wow, apricot is a win. To give you guys some idea of how much clarification is possible, this is a sample of the apricot that I bottled. It was, I think it was just extra that was left over from when we re-racked the secondary. And it's just been sitting on the shelf. Can you see the difference between that and that? It's not a lot, it's not a lot. But this, I'm wondering if it's even better. But you can even see in the bottom of this bottle, there's, there's the stuff that's settled out. And it's, it's such a small amount but that will cloudy this up. I'm tempted, I think, to take this, put it in this bottle, and just leave it on the shelf and let it settle out, and then maybe try to find a better racking cane that's maybe designed for these smaller lids, you know, these smaller um, necks, because I'm definitely fighting this. When I said having the right tools makes all the difference, here I am fighting the racking cane. I don't think this is worth throwing away because if we can get it to settle out, like that, it'll be delicious and drinkable. Apricot is done. We have three more fruits to take care of. We have blueberry, raspberry, and huckleberry.
Mm. So good. Wow. Mm. Yes, raspberry, yes. This home brewing seriously will drive you to drink. Look at all that, guys. Holy smokes. That's only, only, that's only four gallons of mead. Mmm. Wow. I think the extra time aging this was genius. This tastes better than any mead I've ever had even the stuff that we made two years ago. Although, I'm not sure because I haven't tasted that last bottle that's left. So I'm kind of curious if that stuff is like perfect mead. This stuff might be good enough to enter into the fair. That could be kind of fun this fall. See if we could win a trophy. My plan didn't quite work out. We ran short of bottles but that's okay some of these are just kind of like sampling bottles so we'll probably finish that pretty soon so in the end i just have the one monster cider bottle but i have a hunch this stuff is so delicious i don't think it's gonna stick around for that long well what do you think of our new mead collection wow don't you think the clear bottles were a good idea oh yeah so i've tried the blueberry and the apricot yeah and the apricot is my favorite it is so good this is do you think this is the best i think the apricot's the best but i'm i think raspberry is a very close second wow that's pretty good that's pretty, good. Good. That's that's pretty really good, good huh but i don't know my favorite really uh -huh. i like the raspberry flavor wow but Still i think cooking. the apricot's pretty good <laughs> this mm. one hands down all right so more raspberry mead you guys mm -hmm. heard her yep I think home brewing is one of those things that's good for you if you have a lot of patience and you appreciate things that get better with age. If you're a big fan of the microwave, things that are fast, fast food, uh, mead's probably not in your palate anyway, or wine. But if you really appreciate the nuances of something, and if you're the kind of person who cans or gardens or likes home projects, you're kind of a chemist on the side a little bit, Take a look at home brewing if you haven't already done it. I know there's a massive community out there. They're super generous. The knowledge is plentiful. It's just a Google search away. And of course, like everything, you'll find a million opinions about how to do something. We found the local brew shop, which unfortunately is no longer in business. But anyway, they were a super great resource. We ended up finding this amazingly simple little book. Let me show you. If you find this book, it's maybe six or seven bucks. It'll get you going on mead. Our local brew shop had this little hard or this little paper book. And even though the internet is a click away, I feel like the, the common sense of this book far outweighs its price. And it has recipes in here for everything. In fact, the foreword of the book is kind of funny because it says if if you're one of those people that thinks that wine comes from grapes, you might not like this book because, well, there's no grape wine recipes. It's everything you can imagine. I think we can find this online if we can, we'll link to it. If not, try to look at your local brew shop. Pick it up, it's a thin little guy. It'll get you going with really simple recipes and really simple techniques to make all of your own wines from anything that you probably have around, including dandelions and fruit, of course. I think the only thing left to do with this project is to figure out storage. Uh, we do have a mechanical room in our house that we're building and uh, we can keep it kind of dark most of the time. In fact, we're gonna be using it kind of as a dark room to store things that are sensitive, root vegetables, things like that. So we may have to keep this out of the light uh, when it's in storage, but of course, as we bring it out, it's really enjoyable to look at, which is what we were looking for. Once we get storage figured out, I kind of have a plan this year to step up our foraging. Uh, last year, we picked 25 gallons of cherries for free. They were just 
a neighborhood tree. The problem is we found worms in those cherries and we ended up throwing them out. But I, you guys are gonna like to hear this, but I think you can make some amazing mead even if the cherries had worms in them because you're gonna strain all that stuff out and you're gonna end up with this beautiful liquid. So in the interest of not letting perfectly good fruit go to waste, uh, we may try to tackle cherry mead this year. We're hoping to score some more apricots and our neighbors got raspberries. We know somebody with blueberries and we're hoping to find a, a score of huckleberries again this year. So my goal is to stockpile fruit all year and then hopefully do like a five gallon batch of each fruit come winter time. This were, these were one gallon batches. I wanted to kind of get back in the groove and test this out. I think once we get it dialed, we'll kind of always have mead in rotation and we should have a mead pantry that rivals our vegetable pantry.